Sometimes I have a weird response to monk fruit where it actually spikes my insulin and it drops my blood sugar down, whereas my wife doesn't have the same response. There's no way that I could have ever been able to acquire that data if I wasn't monitoring my blood glucose utilizing continuous glucose monitor. So this video is about what I have learned about blood glucose, blood glucose drops, stable glucose levels, all while wearing a CGM. And I'm gonna share it all with you. So the big important piece we have to remember above all else is you will always have a level of blood glucose, whether you are keto, whether you are fasting, it is the job of your body to keep your glucose levels elevated so that you do not die. Okay, so let's just get that out of the equation altogether. But I've learned some interesting things in wearing a continuous glucose monitor. Okay, mainly the things that drive my glucose up. Okay, now some of these things are a little bit more casual and things you probably know of. Okay, for example, consuming carbohydrates, consuming glucose is obviously going to be driving my glucose levels up. But I've also learned that certain proteins are going to drive my glucose levels up. I've learned that certain kinds of exercise are going to drive my glucose levels up. And a lot of that comes to be with, well, the liberation of glycogen, stored carbohydrates in your muscles that are ultimately, or stored in your liver as well, that are going to get liberated into the bloodstream and give you energy for a given workout. That can drive your blood glucose level up. But more importantly, I started learning things like sleep and like stress would elevate my blood glucose levels, not just in an acute short-term phase, but in a longer term phase as well. And I'll give you a casual example. Prior to Thanksgiving, I plugged in my continuous glucose monitor with my Cygnos app, which we'll talk a little bit about more in a minute. And I found that my glucose levels were relatively stable, but pretty high. Now, mind you, I have a three-year-old and an eight-month-old, so I don't exactly get a ton of sleep every single night. Well, during that period, I wasn't sleeping much and my glucose levels were pretty high. Then we go into Thanksgiving time. Well, okay, I'm away from work. I have family members to kind of help take care of the kids for a little bit. And what do you know? My glucose levels drop about 15 points and remain stable there with nothing else changing. Okay, diet was pretty clean. Yes, we had a spike with Thanksgiving, but overall the diet remained consistent and my response to foods changed. Okay, so the point here is that stress and sleep deprivation play huge roles because you're going to have different external factors, different hormonal factors, different what are called catecholamines like adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, all that. Okay, but now let's drop over to things that might make it drop because that's a whole different ball game, right? Okay, certain kinds of food can actually make your blood glucose drop because it can trigger an insulin spike that's actually gonna bring your blood glucose down. Talk about that more in other videos, but other things, more intense exercise. For example, you're burning up the glucose that you are consuming and your body's actually utilizing it, so that can trigger a drop. And the opposite side of the equation, getting your sleep in or reducing stress can be dropping that blood glucose level. And at the end of this, we start saying, okay, well, why does all this matter? Okay, what good is it really teaching me? Well, I'm gonna get into the nitty gritty of it, but what's really important to remember is one really cardinal thing. If you are having a high spike of your blood glucose, there is a very high chance that that will get converted into fat. And I know that this resonated with you because just like anybody, body composition is something that's important. And as someone that's lost 100 pounds, I completely understand and I'm very aware when something could potentially cause me to gain fat, right? So the goal is to maintain relatively stable blood glucose levels. And that's a really difficult thing to do casually, right? You can take people's word for it. You can say that the internet says a certain food's gonna modulate your blood sugar, et cetera, et cetera. But without your own data, it's really hard to tell. And the big piece of the equation comes into that bio-individuality how different people respond to different foods. There are some pretty massive meta-analysis that take a look that see that people respond differently to different foods. Quite literally, someone can eat cookies and not have the same negative blood sugar response as someone else gets eating a sweet potato. Okay, it can be completely wild and completely random and it all depends on you as a person, your genotype, and a bunch of different factors. But if we can acquire the data to discover that, then it paints a bigger picture. So recently, I've been wearing a continuous glucose monitor utilizing what is called the Cygnos app. Okay, so this whole process is really cool because it's allowed me to not only see how I respond to given foods and things like that, but it aggregates that data for me so that I can actually manage my life a little bit better and see this stuff. So I wouldn't know, for example, that oatmeal is causing a glucose spike for me when I'm stressed out, but doesn't cause a spike when I'm completely relaxed. I wouldn't know that information if I couldn't acquire that data. So that's exactly where Cygnos comes in and wearing a continuous glucose monitor is great, 
but if you're not aggregating the data from that glucose monitor into something that's applicable, it's really, really difficult to really get a grasp of what you need to change or how you respond to a given food. I'll expand a little bit more. So if we come back to that sort of monk fruit example, right? I was fasting that day, so my blood glucose should have been pretty stable, and it was. And then all of a sudden, I have a little bit of monk fruit with some iced tea. Okay, and I notice that I get a sudden drop in my glucose levels. Well, what the heck? What gives? Okay, I, I even texted the founder of Cygnos and said, what's, what's going on? He said, that's really wild. And we started kind of brainstorming on it and realized that, well, that means that there could have been an insulin spike. So I can get into the deep biochemistry, but I'll touch on it for just a second. Basically, I had an insulin spike that dropped my blood sugar because suddenly my cells accepted the glucose. Well, there's other days where monk fruit has not done that to me. So what kind of factors can I be playing in here? Again, if you're aggregating the data, you can see that. And who really has time to write all that stuff down and to compile it? If you have it condensed in a simple form, it allows you to look at the big picture. So why is stability so important though? Okay, because we hear people say that constantly. You wanna keep your blood sugar stable. And I feel like it goes in one ear and out the other because it's just, we've been told it constantly. Okay, well, having stable blood sugar levels are important because that is how you determine when you are going out of range and might potentially gain fat or when you're going out of range the other way and might have other issues, okay? So a simple example is if your blood glucose levels are stable, even if they're moderately high-ish, and I say that a little bit loosely, but you, know, you don't wanna be super high, but even if your levels are a little bit high, as long as you're stable, it's a good indicator that your body is correcting and managing properly. And I think that's the operative word here. It's proper management. We want our bodies to be able to notice that there's a spike in glucose and be able to correct accordingly with the proper hormonal response to that, which in this case would be insulin and subsequently glucagon. Okay, if our body doesn't respond to that, i.e. insulin resistance, then the glucose just continues to climb and plateaus at a high level, and then we have a problem because we're unstable. So you could take apples to oranges and completely different blood glucose stable levels, but as long as they're stable and not having big rises and falls, it's not the end of the world. So that's exactly why when you're like pricking your finger, it doesn't necessarily give you the best readout because that's a snapshot in time that could have a lot of different variables. So I'm gonna circle back to sort of foods that we might consider healthy for a second, right? So I'm just gonna give a hypothetical example. Let's say I ate a sweet potato and that sweet potato didn't give me a very serious blood glucose response. I didn't see a big spike in it, so I deem sweet potatoes as a relatively safe food for me. Well, then mentally in my memory banks, I kind of plug it in there. And I'm like, okay, this is great. This is perfectly good food. Then I go through an extremely stressful period of time. Okay, I get really stressed out. Maybe I got a bunch of stuff going on at work or family, whatever. Well, mentally, I have it saved in my mind that I can default to sweet potatoes because they're a healthy food and they don't affect me negatively. Great, right? Wrong, because then I have that sweet potato and guess what? Because I'm in a completely different physiological state, I have a negative reaction to it. How would I have ever been able to determine that if I wasn't monitoring my glucose continually and actually having a big picture painted of it and have it sort of algorithmically laid out for me. Again, that's where Cygnos comes in, being able to actually look at the data. As someone that's a busy dad, as someone that is a busy person and managing multiple companies, I understand the value of being able to have a snapshot and not have to write everything down consistently. So imagine how this looks with what you've been told for the last 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. Been told, that this is the way to do things. Even with my videos, right? You apply everything that I instruct, everything that I teach, and yet the needle doesn't move, right? And it's easy to pick on yourself. I am the problem, this isn't working, why isn't this working, what am I doing wrong, and you're beating yourself up. Well, until you have the data to truly show how you're responding to something or what's actually happening, you're gonna continue to beat yourself up. It's not your fault because there's variables that you simply cannot know without A, being a psychic or B, having the data. So if you can compile that and you can paint a big picture, you can get one step closer to really achieving your results. Remember, always what we say on this channel, you pursue results and you reinforce with science. And that applies to your data too. You pursue results, try something new and reinforce it with data to see what is truly working and then you work forward from there. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.